Um, I'm Tony Stillman, uh, here, at, here at the AMA Museum, the National Model Aviation Museum in Muncie, Indiana. And we're going to talk a little bit about the history of radio control. Um, we're going to start off really where radio control began for most of us, and that, that's uh, with Walt Good and the Good Brothers and their aircraft, the Big Gulf. This was really the first model that was successful, and they flew this, uh, this was back in 1937. So this is a pretty cool piece of history, and it's nice to see the original radio and equipment. And this was actually the transmitter, which had a great big antenna that was base, a base antenna, and this was actually the radio that's in the aircraft, so this has been pulled out. And this is actually the equipment that was in the aircraft that we flew it with, obviously very large, and it was just rudder elevator. So now we're gonna move over here to the radio display case. Um, and here again, at the very beginning, there weren't any commercially available radio systems. So all the equipment was something that was passed along. They would take somebody's designs and modify it and improve it, do a few things. And so over a period of time, uh, modelers, as who modelers are, they take equipment and make it better, make changes. And we went through several different types of radio equipment and added new channels. So instead of just operating rudder or rudder and elevator, they came through more and more channels. We had rudder, elevator, and throttle, and trim, and then ailerons. But as we started moving into the 60s and the 70s, we were able to get transistors, and transmitters got much smaller. One of the earlier ones would be the Citizenship Radio Control, which was a kit. And you could buy that kit, uh, that's the, the assembled ones laying on the bottom. You could buy that kit for $24.95 and assemble it yourself you had a transmitter that you could hold in your hand and this proportional transmitter that's in the middle that was that was kind of a real innovative type design before you had either full right or full left or full up or full down you actually went to proportional where wherever you move the stick that's where the control surfaces would move just like a full-scale airplane you move it part way the control surface moves part way at this particular time virtually all the equipment was made in the United States which is this might seem kind of strange to the new modelers but all the equipment was made here in the USA. And keep in mind, these were all just single model airplanes. They weren't computerized. Um, you usually had one transmitter for every airplane you had. So if you had five or six airplanes, you had five or six transmitters. And then we kind of started transitioning outside of build it yourself. Heath kit was probably one of the last ones around that had a kit that you actually assembled. And then in the, in the late 70s, um, the Japanese radio equipment started showing up on the market. Futaba was really the first ones uh, in the U.S. market. They were cheaper, very reliable, good quality, and started giving the U.S. companies a run for their money. The items here on the bottom start showing the 2.4 conversion, and the 2.4 system <clears throat> was really a breakthrough in that you could just turn on your radio and you could fly and it would not interfere with anybody else. So. That improved safety, improved uh, conditions to where we could fly more models together, have different competitions that we weren't able to hold before. And that's kind of paved the way to today's radio system. Kind of a quick overview on, on our history and where we've come from. If, you, if you're fairly new to modeling, you haven't been flying for maybe only 10 years or so, you probably haven't seen a lot of these older radios. So um, it's uh, something you might want to take a look at. Come by the museum here in Muncie and you get a chance and look through some of these items. and. Uh, and then again, talk to some, some of your older folks there at, the, at your club. They probably have some experience with them and uh, can give you a little insight on what it was like to fly back in the 70s and even earlier. 